It's hard to believe, but we've made it to the end of this course. In this final module, I want to cover some major issues that are facing landscape managers. With the recent troubles that managed honeybees have had, even urban residents are asking what they can do to help. There are dozens of websites and TV programs dispensing accurate and not so accurate information. So, I want to provide you with my perspectives about encouraging pollinators and paying attention to pollinator safety. Likewise, butterfly gardening seems to be a common theme and everybody wants to save the poor monarch. But butterfly gardening is more than providing milkweeds for monarch butterflies. There are many other butterflies deserving of our attention. As an entomologist, I have to roll my eyes when the general public discussed pollinators when they really mean the domesticated honeybee. There are so many pollinators that are in our urban landscapes and other environments that it boggles the mind. However, there is no doubt that true bees have evolved to be the masters of pollination. They are covered with hairs and the hairs have hairs. All of this sets up static charges that attract pollen grains to their bodies. However, there are plenty of non-bee pollinators in the insect world. I don't want to belittle the syndrome called colony collapse syndrome. It is a real phenomenon and it has occurred several times in recorded history. Today we understand that there are dozens of factors that can greatly affect the health and functioning of domestic honeybees. Here is a graphic that tries to illustrate the interrelationships of the multitude of factors that influence honeybee health. There are biotic and abiotic factors, and the experience level of the beekeeper can have a major influence on how the colony survives. Bottom line, it's a complicated system. Unfortunately, the general public likes things to be simple, black and white situations. It's so easy to blame pesticides as being the cause of colony collapse disorder when we know that there are many other factors that are involved. While there is ample evidence that insecticides and other pesticides, when improperly used, can have dramatic adverse effects on bee populations, pesticides are not the only cause of the troubles that honeybees are suffering. As an entomologist, I try to take a wider view of what may be going on. First, I heartily acknowledge that bees are an important part of our ecosystem, but when I say bees, I'm including all the bees, not just the domesticated honeybee. We have already discussed the problems with complex urban environments, and our urban environments easily provide food, water, and nesting habitat for our pollinators. But this doesn't mean that we can't do a better job of providing these necessities. And there is no doubt that pesticides, by their very nature, are designed to kill things. And if we don't use them properly, we can kill non-targets like bees. Our urban landscapes are complex, and bees can actually do pretty well in these environments. My personal thoughts are that these landscapes often provide nectar and water, but nesting sites may be missing in high-maintenance landscapes. We can do better. Remember that not all plants are insect pollinated. In fact, conifers and most grasses, including grass-type crops like corn, wheat, and rice, are wind pollinated. Unfortunately, most of our fruits and vegetables need pollination services, and this is usually done by an insect. However, some plants depend on birds and bats to perform pollination services. When pollinated plants don't have flashy flowers, nor do they produce fragrances that are attractive to an insect pollinator. When pollinated plants also produce abundant pollen so that the chances of a successful pollination is guaranteed. However, for those of us who suffer pollen allergies, these plants can also be a real issue. Here is a picture of a conifer with one seed cone, the one that is upright, and several pollen cones, the smaller ones hanging down. Pines, spruces, firs, and other conifers are notorious for the copious amounts of pollen that they produce in the spring. 
I just heard on the weather report last night that the pollen count is off the scale. When they posted where the pollen was coming from, it was grass pollen. When it comes to plants that rely on pollination services, the plants do a variety of things to attract potential pollinators. They can produce sugary offerings that provide carbohydrate energy to the pollinator. Many broadcast that they have something to offer through fragrances. What smells sweet to us is just attractive to bees, but rotten odors are attractive to many flies. Many flowering plants can use other techniques to fool a potential pollinator. The famous bee orchid apparently looks like a female bee to the male bee. When the male tries to copulate with his flower, he is heavily dusted with pollen. When he tries to mate with another flower, he pollinates it. The cast of insect pollinators is a long one. Bees are the top specialist pollinators, but flies can also be very important. If you have ever noticed, hawthorns have a rather rotten smelling flower, and this attracts a lot of flies and beetles. However, linden trees have a strong and sweet smell that bees and moths can't resist. Let's quickly go through some of the pollinators that are commonly seen in our urban landscapes. Bumblebees are generally large species and they can be recognized because of their small heads are obviously about half the width of the thorax. These are social species. However, the carpenter bee can look a lot like a bumblebee, but carpenter bees have a head that is nearly as wide as the thorax. And carpenter bees are solitary species, living in burrows chewed out of wood or dead branches of trees and shrubs. The squash bee is a specialist species. It is primarily attracted to squash blossoms. So if your cucumbers or squash plants aren't setting fruit, it's likely that you don't have squash bees in the area. Females make nests in the ground. Newly emerged males stay in the flowers even overnight when the flowers are closed so that they can mate with any female that tries to visit the flower the following day. Not all bees are appreciated in our landscape. Leafcutter bees usually take notches out of landscape tree leaves to line their burrows. The females are easy to spot as they store their collected pollen on hairs lining the undersides of their abdomens. Remember that the leafcutter bees can be really irritating to homeowners who want perfect foliage on their plants. These bees often cut out circles or ovals from things like roses. Here's a leafcutter bee nest where you can see how the leaf sections have been used to line the burrow and form cells where pollen and nectar are stored for the larvae. There are many solitary bees that nest in ground burrows or the holes in trees left behind when wood boring beetles emerge. The little plasterer bees can occur by the hundreds in a flower bed or thin turf and homeowners are often concerned that they are going to get stung. These are extremely docile species and they won't sting unless you try to pick one up. Most of the solitary bees build burrows in the ground or use holes made by boars. The females collect pollen and nectar to provision larval cells. The little iridescent green or blue halictid or sweat bees are also solitary. These often build cells and rotting logs which are also provisioned with pollen and nectar for their larvae. Have you ever noticed that a lot of the wasps visit flowers? They too are collecting nectar and eating pollen to provide them with the energy needed to perform their other tasks. While doing this, they are also pollinating the flowers. Even the annoying mosquitoes can be pollinators. The males, especially, only feed on nectar of flowers, so they are considered to be beneficial pollinators. Some beetles are attracted to flowers that produce odors that mimic rotting animals or feces. Other beetles can be attracted to milder fragrances produced by flowers. In this case, this Shasta daisy has attracted several domestic beetles that are eating the pollen. These beetles are also pollinating the plant. 
Butterflies and moths are often underappreciated for their pollination services. Virtually all need nectar to fuel their flight. So when they visit a flower, they also pick up some pollen that can be taken to another plant. So, how can we be more supportive of our pollinators? My thoughts are that we need to provide nesting sites and food, which is nectar and pollen sources, throughout the season. We can also help by only treating plants that have real pest issues and refrain from spraying the entire landscape with pesticides. It is especially important to not spray plants that are in bloom as this will immediately expose a pollinator to the full power of the insecticide. Even on non-flowering plants, spray early in the morning or late in the evening when pollinators are least active and this can minimize exposure. I also recommend selecting insecticides that are known to have a minimal effect on pollinators like insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils. Establishing and maintaining a honeybee hive is not a pursuit that should be undertaken without commitment of time and effort needed to keep the colony healthy and active. This isn't something that you can set up and walk away from. However, beekeeping can be a really rewarding activity. Most beekeeping organizations are glad to train new beekeepers. Solitary bees can also be cared for and encouraged in our landscape. Bumblebee boxes are an excellent choice. These can be built or purchased. They are basically an elongated box with two chambers. The outer chamber is empty and allows for the incoming bee to clean itself, accumulate all the pollen collected, and fight off any potential intruding insects. The inner chamber should contain some nesting material, which can be wooden excelsior or shredded paper. These boxes should be placed on the ground early in the spring to entice any overwintered bumblebee queens to set up shop. The lid should be firmly attached or held down with a big weight as skunks and raccoons commonly try to get into the boxes to eat the brood pots. And after each season the boxes need to be thoroughly cleaned out and sterilized. Other solitary bees often like to nest in hollow reeds, the pithy stems of branches, and in holes left behind after a borer has emerged. You can purchase these houses commercially or build them yourselves. Generally, these should be cleaned out occasionally to inhibit the buildup of diseases and parasitoids that can attack the bees. To recap my previous statements, we need to use insecticides in our urban landscapes wisely and use the IPM approach is the ideal. When using IPM, we would use pesticides only when and where needed. We would not use any so-called cover sprays. And we'd carefully inspect the labels of products to see if they have any significant bee warnings. Speaking of bee warnings, this is what they look like on an insecticide label. Really dangerous insecticides now have the bee warning box. Even without this box, some insecticides can have lesser warnings about bee hazards. Not all insecticides pose great risk to honeybees. The botanical insecticide azadiractin seems to be one of these. Here's the environmental hazard section of that azatrol label. Notice that there can be some hazards with aquatic systems, so you definitely don't want this insecticide to drop or run off into ponds or streams. Even though there is no specific bee warning, I still wouldn't want to spray this directly onto bees that are working blooming plants. Thus, use this on plants that are not in bloom or make the application early or late in the day when most bees are in their homes. In summary, we need to provide more essential needs for pollinators, especially all the bees. This means we need to provide nesting sites and continuous sources of food and water. Don't use any general cover sprays of insecticides in the landscape. And avoid using pesticides that have major bee warnings, such as some of the neonicotinoids. 
Virtually all of them have a statement to not spray or apply them when plants are in bloom. So let's talk about butterfly gardening. Unfortunately, for most general gardeners, this simply means planting flowers that are attractive to the adult butterflies. To an entomologist, this is ignoring the fact that all butterflies are insects with a complete life cycle. If you really want butterflies in your landscape, you will need to provide for all stages, especially food for the larvae. Let's take a look at some of the more common and showy species. The black swallowtail is very common because its larva feeds on almost any plant in the carrot family. Weedy plants like Queen Anne's lace are used, but parsley, fennel, and even plain carrots can be used. The larva is called the parsley worm. Giant swallowtails have larvae that are called orange dogs because the larvae are often found on citrus plants. So how does this grow in more northern locations? The answer is that the larvae also eat prickly ash leaves. This small shrub-like tree is often found along woodlot edges. The showy tiger swallowtail has larvae that prefer to feed on tulip trees. The larvae can also be found on cherry and sweet bay magnolias. Red admiral larvae are most commonly found on the leaves of trees in the black oak family. The painted lady butterfly has larvae that feed on stinging nettles, which are weedy plants along the forest edges. The buckeye butterfly migrates north each summer and the adults lay eggs on snapdragon and common plantain weeds. The morning cloak butterfly overwinters as adults that lay eggs on elms and willows as the new leaves emerge in the spring. In fact, their larvae are called spiny elm caterpillars. These caterpillars can defoliate a couple of branches, but this causes little harm to the tree. Cabbage white butterflies are actually invasives from Europe, and their larvae are the common cabbage worm. These can be encouraged in a landscape by growing plants like ornamental kale. All butterfly garden enthusiasts talk about helping the monarch butterflies. Obviously, the best way to do this is to grow milkweeds in the landscape. While common milkweed is the best plant, this plant has minimal ornamental value. Asclepius is a good alternative that is used by the larvae, and the plants have attractive blooms. Many of the spotted skipper butterflies have larvae that feed on legumes like clovers, black locusts, and wisteria. Other skippers have larvae that use grasses, even common lawn grasses. Remember that butterfly adults need more than just nectar. They need water, salts, and other habitats in addition to the nectar. To provide nectar to butterflies, a wide array of plants will probably be needed. The idea is to have plants that are in bloom throughout the season so that there are always nectar sources. Color and bloom heights are also important factors when designing landscapes that will be attractive to butterflies. Water sources are important to butterflies. Most get moisture from their nectar, but other water sources are important. Butterflies often puddle. They need salts and minerals, which is usually obtained by filtering water that is found in damp soils. Trays with damp soils can provide suitable puddling sites. There are several gardening catalogs trying to sell butterfly hotels and shelters. These are generally a waste of money. Butterflies will hide in trees and shrubs during rainfall events. I've often seen butterflies hiding under my house overhang and nooks around my deck. Just be sure that cats and kids don't disturb them. In summary, when approaching butterfly gardening, try to pay attention to providing a season-long landscape that has some flowering plants at all times. 
Also try to cultivate plants that can be used by butterfly larvae and don't worry when they show up and eat a few leaves. Finally, use IPM. Resist using insecticides everywhere in the landscape and when insecticides are to be used, select products that have short residual action and specific activity.